Hi, everyone, and welcome to Chicago Autism Network's virtual parent workshops. Tonight, we are very happy to hear from occupational therapist Aubrey Fisher and speech language, speech language pathologist Monique Plat Plagic. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I will turn the time over to them and introduce themselves. Uh, thanks, Kimmy. We're so excited to be here tonight. I'm Aubrey. Um, I'm a pediatric occupational therapist at Rush Kids Pediatric Therapy. And this is Monique Pacek. She is a speech language pathologist at Rush Kids. Um, we are both certified autism specialists, and we are also neurodiversity affirming therapists. Um, we work with children, adolescents, and teens in our outpatient setting. And in addition to working directly with families and clients, we also um, are a part of a developmental diagnostic clinic with a clinical psychologist. Um, we're really excited to be here tonight to talk about regulation. It's such an important part of our job and really core to what we do as therapists. Um, we have tailored our talk tonight to discuss co-regulation and self-regulation for autistic individuals. Um, tonight, you will hear us using identity affirming language, um, which means we'll use things like uh, autistic child um, versus a child with autism. And we're doing that because we have received um, information from autistic adults who have told us that that is the way that that community would like to be referred to. So um, we just want to lay that out there. We respect and understand that everybody has different preferences, um, but that is what you'll be hearing from us tonight. Um, so just an outline of what we're going to cover tonight. Um, we're going to talk about an overview of sensory processing and regulation. We're going to talk about what dysregulation is. We'll talk about co-regulation and how we move that into self-regulation for our kids. Um, and we're also going to talk about communication and its role in self-regulation. Um, and then we're going to review a couple of case studies for you guys. And when we finish the talk tonight, we will be able to share um, a PDF of the information that we discussed today. So sensory processing is a way that our central nervous system or our brain receives messages from our senses, information from the environment, and also our internal sensations. It's how it integrates that information and makes sense of it, and then how we respond with a graded emotional and motor response. Um, you might be really familiar with the five senses that we talk about a lot, which are our smell, our taste, our sight, our touch, and our hearing, but we also have some hidden senses that are really central to regulation, and those include our vestibular system, our proprioceptive system, and interoception. So our vestibular system is how we interpret movement, where our head is in space. If we are moving or if we are still, if we're upside down or right side up, it's our inner ears way of telling our brain where um, our body is in space. Proprioception is how we interpret where our body is in space. So vestibular is kind of where our head is and proprioception is where our body is. Um, if you were to imagine yourself in the dark with the lights turned off, you would probably have a pretty good sense of where your arm is in relationship to your body um, or where your legs are in relation to your head. That's our proprioception. Um, it tends to be a really regulate, regulating sense for um, our regulation. And it's something we'll kind of unpack a little bit more tonight as we go on. Interoception is probably the sense that most people have not heard of. And it is how we interpret um, the internal state of our body. So our brain receives messages from receptors around our body, from our organs, from our skin, from our muscles, and that helps us interpret how we feel. So that's kind of where our pain sensation comes from, temperature, if we're feeling itchy, hunger, thirst, our heart rate, um, things like if we have to use a bathroom or if we're feeling sleepy. So it's really kind of that internal sensation um, to tell us what our body needs in a given moment. And what we've learned with autistic or neurodivergent individuals is that they often experience these sensations in a different way or describe them differently to people. So it's an important sensation for us to understand and help our um, autistic kids and teenagers understand so that they can help regulate their bodies. Um, just to give you guys an overview, about 80% of people with autism do have sensory processing disorder or sensory processing challenges that can um, with our daily lives. So it's a really important topic for us to cover and for us to understand. Um, our central nervous system develops over time. It naturally matures, but sometimes we need a push or we need some support to help our system mature so that we can stay calm and regulated. 
If your child is in occupational therapy, you might have heard some of these terms before. Um, this is uh, kind of the um, gold standard way of how we are describing children who have sensory processing needs. Um, right now, you can kind of focus on just the colored circles. I know there's a lot on this image, but the colored circles is what we'll cover first. Um, so there are four categories that we tend to categorize our children into who have sensory processing differences or needs. Um, so the first one is that purple circle, and that's sensory sensitive. So that's the child who detects input at a higher rate or a higher intensity than other children. Um, commonly with these kids, we see tactile defensiveness, which is where you might be more bothered by tactile input, and that often plays out in grooming activities. So like brushing teeth, cutting nails, getting your hair cut or brushed, that can be really bothersome or really sensitive to our kids who are sensory sensitive. Um, they might perceive a room as really bright that has fluorescent lights to the point that it, it dysregulates them. Um, and they might be overly alert to distractions within their environment. So somebody who's walking through the room, um, they might be distracted by noise that's happening in another room um, or items in their environment they're really interested in or distracted by. The yellow circle is sensory avoiding, and that is a child who withdraws from input that they find bothersome and especially that they find out of their control. Um, this child might actually have an aggressive or an emotional response to input that they find bothersome, um, such as touch. They might just become to um, avoid or refuse altogether input that is bothersome to them. Um, these children often find loud or unexpected noises really triggering. Um, often we see with kids who are sensory sensitive, they end up being sensory avoidant. They're really detecting this input at a higher rate to the point where they feel they need to avoid or withdraw from this input to protect themselves. Um, the next category is the green circle, and that is low registration. These are our kids who do not detect or they miss sensory input more than others. They're not actually registering things going on around them to the degree that we'd expect. So this is a child who maybe doesn't register their name being called. Um, maybe they're not noticing someone who enters the room. Uh, they often have lower body awareness. They might be propping their body or draping themselves on furniture or requiring a little more support, bumping into things in their environment. Um, these children often have lower awareness or higher tolerance for pain. Um, they might be oblivious to messy hands or face. And our next category is the blue circle and that's sensory seeking. So that's a child who obtains or attempts to obtain and really seeks out movement or other types of sensory input at a greater rate than others. These are children who are often described as bouncing off the walls um, or taking excessive movement risks at the park or at home that might be pretty unsafe. Um, they often need something to touch or to fidget with in their environment and they're seeking out a lot of input as they are navigating their daily environments. They might put objects in their mouth or they might like purposely running in or bumping into things. Now, kids can fall into one of these categories, but they can also fall into two, three, or four, all four of them. And that's kind of indicating to us that the child has a more dysregulated or more disorganized sensory system when they fall into more than one of these categories. Um, it can also be helpful if we turn to these arrows, the up and down arrows that talk about hyposensitivity and hypersensitivity. The child that's hyposensitive, they are, um, under aroused, and they need a lot more input to feel alert or regulated or engaged. And these tend to be our kids who are seekers. Um, our kids who are hypersensitive, they're the sensory sensitive or sensory avoiding children. They tend to move away from the input that they find bothering, bothersome. It's too sensitive for their system. Now, for people in our audience, this might be um, familiar if you've worked a lot with an occupational therapist, or it might have been kind of an overwhelming amount of information to understand those four different systems. You might be, you know, connecting some of the dots with your child and where they fit into those categories. But I really like to use this um, example with my families of regulation. So we have this band or this zone where we feel regulated throughout the day. And we all fluctuate in and out of this zone based on how things are going in our environment or in our internal state throughout the day. And it's natural for us to kind of flow up and down. Sometimes we're feeling over-responsive um, or overstimulated by our environment. And we're up 
above this zone of regulation. This is where we might feel agitated by background noise. Um, we maybe can't concentrate because we're really cold in an over air conditioned um, workspace. We might feel overheated by stress um, or really hungry. And during those situations, we as adults know how to modify or adapt our environment naturally or do things for ourselves to help us get back to this calm and regulated state. So we might do things like dim the lights or put on headphones or turn on white noise in our office. We might open a window or go for a walk or just fidget in our chair to help ourselves kind of calm and regulate back to that zone. Sometimes we're feeling understimulated or unaffected by the information around us. And in those instances, we feel kind of low arousal or drowsy and we'll do things to help alert ourselves back to that zone of regulation. We might drink coffee or let in fresh air um, or move our body around. So often our autistic children are trying so hard throughout their day to get back to the zone of regulation. And sometimes they have strategies to get themselves back to that regulation zone. Um, often we'll see autistic children stimming um, or obtaining sensory input that they find enjoyable or regulating for their system in order to, to get themselves back to that regulated state. Um, but that can be really challenging to maintain throughout the day and to really re-regulate frequently when we're fluctuating up and down so much. And that's where we kind of come in with these strategies for co-regulation and self-regulation to help our kids have a plethora of strategies to get back to that regulated state um, and also to be able to access those activities more easily when they have a lot of demands going on around them. This slide, I really just wanted to highlight that when we look at our children and when we see that they are dysregulated, it can be really hard. I hear from families a lot that it seems like there's no trigger or I'm just not sure what is causing frustration or upset or you know, this really overstimulated state. And I think it's important for us to see that aside from sensory overload, which is just feeling overstimulated or maybe even sensory deprivation where we're not getting enough input we need to feel regulated, there's a whole host of other reasons, especially with our autistic learners and their profile of, of regulating and some of the challenges that we see across autistic individuals that could be contributing to dysregulation. So I just wanted to touch on a few of them because I think it's important when we're determining what strategies to use um, or really looking at, at our child and, and determining how we can best support them that it's not always due to sensory and it's not always a behavior that we're seeing. There might be really important things that are going on in the environment or in the task or in the social demand of a situation that are really impacting um, how regulated they can stay. So one of those things being the emotional experience. So how a child is able to manage their momentary emotional stressors. Another is their cognitive overwhelm. So the child who might lack cognitive flexibility, or understanding of a task and its parts and being able to see the outcome or the big picture versus the small steps to get there, um, that cognitive overwhelm could be causing dis dysregulation. Lacking closure to an important routine. That is something we often see with our autistic children who have some more rigid or ritualized behaviors or routines that they follow and they feel regulated by or that are really important to how they're playing or learning. And so often, we as neurotypical adults or as other kids can move quickly between task to task, but sometimes that's not gonna work for our, um, the child that we're working with. And learning their routines and what's important and how they close out those meaningful experiences can be really important. So for example, if your child is really interested in a song routine that pops up with um, a puzzle or a game that they like to play, getting to that end of that song routine might not be a big deal for some kids, but it might be really important for your child to get the closure or the um, experience of doing that whole activity before they move on to something. That's a really common cause of dysregulation. Um, receptive or expressive language breakdown. Um, the child might not be understanding the demands of the space or the activity or a social interaction, or they're not able to effectively communicate their needs um, or their wants or their desires in that situation. And that can really lead to dysregulation. And then lastly, our environment. So what's happening in our environment and how is it impacting the child's ability to stay at a steady place with the regulation? 
So now we're going to move into co-regulation. So this is really the first stage of how we support our child in learning to manage their emotions, their energy levels, and their sensory systems. Co-regulation is when a trusted adult supports the child in regulating and is responsive to their needs, validates their emotions, structures a calm environment around them, and coaches them through regulation strategies. Um, we have something called mirror neurons in our brain. And when we co-regulate with our child, their mirror, non, mirror neurons are activated and that actually enables them to mirror the calmness that you're showing them. Um, so that's kind of the neuroscience behind why we, why we really encourage co-regulation and why it comes really naturally to us as adults to help support our child's regulation. If we can show them a regulated state and we repeat that and we give them a lot of exposure to it, their brains start to learn and adapt and can regulate when they see these stressors and don't perceive them as such, a, as such an impact. So if we wanna think about the steps to co-regulating, I broke it out down into six steps. So the first one is to maintain and manage your own regulation. Because of those mirror neurons, we need to be showing our child what that looks like to feel regulated. And it can be really hard when your child is in a state of dysregulation to manage your own emotions and your own regulation. Um, so that's really the first step. You know, when you're on an airplane and they say that you need to put your mask on first in the case of an emergency, and then you can support your child. It's the same thing here where you need to make sure that you're able to maintain a calm state or we can't support our child in regulating and coming down from um, a big meltdown. The second step is to determine the most likely cause of dysregulation. So like we just talked about, there could be a whole host of reasons. If it's the environment, then that might be the place where you start. Um, often, we're not sure what the trigger is, and we're going to introduce some of these strategies because we know that they can work for a dysregulated child despite what that cause might be. The third step is to create a safe and a calming environment where you can gently guide your child to. So if at home you can create a calming space, a calming corner, or a room that you know will be a consistent space for your child to be led to, um, that can really help them understand that that's where they go, that's where they can feel safe, and that's where they're going to engage in regulation activities. The fourth step is to introduce strategies that aligned to what was dysregulating them. We want you to model the regulation strategy on yourself. We don't expect in this co-regulation stage that the child's going to start engaging and automatically using the tools that even though they might have had the experience were helpful, we're modeling on ourselves and we're showing them what that might look like. And then we might physically support our child in participating in that strategy. If they're not there yet to implement it on their own, we might physically guide what it looks like for them to use a tool or to engage in one of those strategies. The fifth thing is to label their emotions before, during, and after implementing a regulation strategy. Calmly telling them, you know, it looks like you're feeling um, really upset, or it looks like you're feeling extremely silly or really excited, and we're, we're kind of out of this zone of regulation, we're going to go calm down. Talking about what you're doing as you're doing it, kind of narrating for them the, the why and how you're regulating and how you're coming back to that calm state, and then really praising and reinforcing as they regulate through um, using those strategies. So now kind of the what, what are those strategies that we can use to co-regulate? And what I've done is I've broken down our strategies across those sensory systems that we introduce. So the interoception, the visual, the auditory, tactile, vestibular, proprioceptive. And we're gonna talk through what some of those strategies look like and how you can begin to help your child regulate based on how they're presenting at the time. So, we know that whether the child is sensory overloaded or they're experiencing dysregulation for whatever reason, or even if it's an unknown reason to you at that time, these are tools and these are sensory strategies that tend to be regulating for most children. Um, so interoception is the first thing I listed here, and that is that internal state of what's going on emotionally and physiologically. So really we wanna address those bodily and physiological needs first. Um, if we know that maybe this is stemming from hunger or from thirst or from a toileting need, we always want to, of course, address, address that first and try to resolve, is that what's going on? Is that what's causing the dysregulation? To build that interoception, we want to label that internal sensation to support them in building those skills. 
Um, deep breathing is a really important physiological tool. It's one of the best regulation strategies. And this might be not come naturally for your child, but what you can do is you can have them put their hand on your chest as you breathe or on your belly, on their own belly. You can play music or a rhythm that encourages them to breathe in and breathe out. Um, and getting them back to that rhythmical breathing can be a really important first step in regulating. In the visual and auditory system, tools and like modifications that we can do to the environment or to activities that we can introduce to our child to help support their regulation is giving them um, a quieter or calmer space by dimming the lights um, or giving them calming bright or calming um, colored lights that might be interesting to them or might be soothing. Um, providing headphones that cancel out the noise or headphones that provide quiet, calming music or even turning on white noise in the room. Um, for tactile, so what we can do with our hands and how we can provide something to the hands to regulate, we find that often for kids, having something um, to manipulate or do is really regulating to their system. Again, something that's repetitive or that's um, rhythmical can be really helpful when it comes to the tactile system. Um, so providing fidgets or toys that they can manipulate is a great strategy, or even just pulling out a favorite toy of your child's um, that you know when they are in a regulated state or a really happy state when they're playing, that that tends to be a go-to toy. That's a great thing to pull out when they're dysregulated to see if you can engage with them um, and remind them that this is a tool that they can use. Um, when it comes to the tactile system, we have a lot of children who might be defensive, like we talked about, to that tactile input. Um, so providing when you're providing touch to your child when they're dysregulated, Using um, closed fingers on your palm and deep pressure is the best way to provide um, tactile input to your child who might be defensive to that. Something that we're not going to touch on in great detail today, but that might be something you're curious about learning more about or need specific tips or tools for, um, is grooming. Grooming really relates to that tactile system, and I have so many families where brushing teeth, combing hair, bathing, um, getting haircuts, those things can be really challenging. And there are a lot of regulation or sensory tools around that, um, that we could do a whole other presentation on. So if that's something that is meaningful to you and that you'd like more resources on, we'll have our um, email addresses sent to you all. And you would, would be happy to um, chat through that with you or give you specific recommendations for your child as well. Um, moving on to our vestibular system. Um, vestibular, that movement input can be really regulating for kids who are um, out of sorts or out of dysreg or in that dysregulated state. Slow and back and forth, we call it linear movement, tends to be more regulating than spinning or rotary, we call it, um, or random movement. So if your child is in that really overstimulated state, we want to provide rhythmical or back and forth movement. That's going to be calming to their system. If you're under aroused or under alerted and you're trying to alert or engage them with you, um, you want to use random or you want to use spinning um, input to help them be alerted uh, to what's going on in their environment and alerted to you. Um, so some activities that you can do at home is just bouncing your child on your knees or bouncing them on an exercise ball up and down with the emphasis going down into the ball. Um, and again, using that firm touch to know that that's going to be more regulating for them than light touch or when our fingers are spread apart and there's more parts, points of contact. Um, rocking, rocking them in your lap, rocking them on the ball or in a rocking chair, or even kind of going back and forth in a desk chair can be really regulating for a child. Um, and then swinging. If you have access to a swing at a nearby, nearby park, swinging is such a powerful tool for a lot of our autistic kids for regulation. Um, again, that linear back and forth movement or even side to side, but where their head is staying in one plane of motion can be really helpful for regulation. Um, moving over to proprioception. Proprioception is always organizing and regulatory for the entire sensory system. It is the one takeaway is that proprioception um, is going to be the most regulating type of input that you can provide your child. Um, and this is deep pressure input. It is input to the joints and the muscles that give a uh, feedback to the brain that says, this is where my body is in space. I'm safe, I'm regulated, um, my body is calm. And we do that by providing deep pressure or firm touch. If your child is particularly 
um, averse or stressed out by touch. Um, like we talked about, like you can, you know, close your fingers and use firmer pressure, but you could also use a pillow or a stuffed animal or something between yourself and the child, even a towel to provide them that deep pressure that they might accept better than, than your touch or teach them, you know, as we're learning to self-regulate, teaching them to use their own hands um, or their own body to give them that kind of input. But for proprioception, um, we can give bear hugs, we can give squeezes to the extremities, and that looks like starting at the shoulders or at the hips and moving out to the hands or out to the feet um, and giving firm deep pressure all the way down the extremity and repeating that motion. Um, setting up an area in your house that could be used for crashing or smushing a child with pillows, wrapping them up in a blanket or a towel. You could take it right out of the dryer so it's warm and wrapping them up tight. That can be really regulating for their system. Um, for the oral system and the olfactory system, um, our mouth is a really regulating part of our body. When we think back to infancy, um, breastfeeding or bottle feeding, having that suck um, and swallow and breathe pattern is really regulating for our kids. So that's even regulating to us as adults. It's why we chew gum. It's why we sometimes find ourselves biting our nails or chewing on the end of a eraser. Um, that's a really important tool and strategy that we can use for our children. So providing them a drink from a straw cup where they have to suck out of the straw or even using thicker liquids that you give them like a smoothie or a milkshake to drink out of the straw can be really regulating. Um, giving them a chewy tube, something safe that's plastic that we know um, can be used in the mouth to chew and really get that uh, oral seeking desire out if the child is really liking to mouth objects or put their thumb in their mouth or you know, chew on their shirt, um, helping replace that or giving them something regulatory like a chewy tube or a vibration tool. Um, providing a crunchy snack, I can do the same thing as giving it a chewy tube, giving them something like pretzels or crackers to snack on and giving that input to the mouth. Um, and then thinking about that olfactory system, we all know we have smells that are really averse to us and considering that our children who might be really hypersensitive to um, sensory input, they might detect or smell those smells in our environment a lot more. So it's always important to kind of think about that environment, what's going on and what might be bothersome or aversive to your child. So providing calmer sense or just kind of diffusing the sense in your house or in the environment that you're in that might be dysregulating to the child can be helpful. Um, so as your child ages and develops, these are the ways in which we teach and then fade our supports to help them move towards self-regulation. So we start off by anticipating their needs and meeting those needs. Then we model and we label emotions that they might be experiencing or that we're experiencing. Then we teach, teach basic self-calming strategies. So those are things we just review, like breathing. Then we'll build independence and in transitioning to their calming space. So you might take them for the first 30 times to that calming space in your house, and that's where you do the regulating. And they are going to start to learn that that's where I go. That's my safe space to calm down when I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, then we're going to teach more complex calming and coping strategies. So that's things like um, heavy work or accessing our tools out of our toolbox on our own. And that's what we'll cover next in our self-regulation section. Um, teaching and modeling emotional regulation skills. So thinking flexibly and eventually learning to ignore the little things that are bothering us in our environment. We want to always empower our kids to fix and, and change and also adapt to the things that might be challenging for them to perceive, but there might be some things we want to teach them to ignore or brush off that might be causing dysregulation as they mature and as they're ready for that kind of strategy. And then eventually the goal is to be able to provide a space for your child to go off and regulate on their own and access their tools on their own and make mistakes and take time to regulate, but really be able to take ownership of accessing those tools by themselves. So self-regulation, we just kind of talked about how we move into that and what is self-regulation. It is a conscious control of our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and the ability to use regulation strategies with independence. The goal of self-regulation is for the child to respond to their environment and their emotions appropriately or adaptively. Um, first, we teach how to identify that we are dysregulated and then we teach those tools to regulate. Every child's toolbox is gonna look a little bit different, but we want them to have a number of those go-to strategies that they can independently access or they learn to access in different moments of distress or dysregulation. 
They might be actually physical tools that they have, um, but they might be activities or actions that they're going to perform to help themselves regulate. You guys might have heard from your occupational therapist of a sensory diet. And that's really what this is. It's the it's a diet or a list of activities that you can go to that help your body stay regulated and maintain regulation. A good place to start when you're teaching your child self-regulation and building awareness of themselves is something that we call our energy level. So a child's energy level is that arousal level that we've talked about tonight. If they are under aroused or regulated, they're likely moving their body and their brain too slowly. If they're over aroused or over stimulated, they're likely moving their body too quickly. So we can use this tool to show the child and provide them feedback on how their energy level is looking. So often I'll kind of print this out and I will have either like a paper clip um, or a clothespin or I'll print that car out and I'll show my child or I'll use that dial to have them tick and figure out how is my body, how is my body moving right now? Um, am I moving too slow? Do I need to do something to wake my body up? make my rev engine rev up a little bit? Or am I moving too fast? Do I need to figure out how to slow down my engine or come to a stop? Um, finding that just right speed is that optimal zone of regulation. If they are in the blue or red areas, after we've kind of helped them identify that, that's when we can start to teach them the strategies to get back to that green or just right area. Now, this tool is appropriate for your child if they have some of the language and communication prerequisites. Um, so it's often appropriate for preschoolers and children who are showing understanding of the concepts of go and stop and slow and fast, because we're really using those concepts to help them map it onto their body of how they're able to regulate. The zones of regulation might be something you're familiar with, especially if you have school-age children or teenagers. This might be something that you've learned before. Um, it is a really helpful tool in helping our children um, continue on with understanding their energy level, but also mapping on their emotions and what they can do about this to help move them towards that self-regulation. Um, so once your child is showing understanding of energy levels and basic emotions like happy, sad, mad, um, silly, it's a good time to introduce the zones of regulation. This will help build their vocabulary and their understanding of different um, energy levels and different emotions that they might be feeling throughout their day. Um, so it's split into four zones and we have colors associated with them. The steps for your child to work on zones of regulation is to first identify their energy level. Is it low, just right? Is it starting to increase? Is it way too high? Next, to identify their emotion. If I know I'm moving low energy, am I feeling fatigued or tired or bored? If I'm just right, am I ready to learn? Am I relaxed or focused? Um, if I'm starting to feel like I'm moving a little bit too fast, that might mean I'm silly or maybe I'm nervous. Maybe there's some other emotion that's contributing to that, um, that increased speed in my body. And then our high energy, those are our extreme emotions where we start to kind of lose control. Um, and that's where we need to stop and we need to slow down and use some of our regulation tools to get back to a calm state. So after they have done, they've identified their emotion, they determine, do I need to regulate? Is there something about my state right now that tells me I need to regulate back to this green zone, this calm state so that I can do the things I wanna do, so I can learn, so I can play, so I can interact with my peers. Um, and then the fourth step is to identify a tool to help them get back to green. So that's, we'll kind of move into that in a moment, but what tools can they use? We've talked about those co-regulating tools of how the child is able to be supported by the trusted adults in their environment? And then how can they start to recognize the need for those tools on their own and access them? Um, something also important to note is that autistic children often do have different ways of experience, experiencing their internal sensations or their emotions. Um, so we want to honor and help them learn and help us learn so we can continue to support their needs. There are different ways of experiencing emotions and how they might be regulating them differently than we might expect or we might do ourselves. A newer program that um, has emerged out there is a program called the Interoception Program. And it's something that I really love and I think fits really well for um, my autistic clients who have kind of, uh, you know, learned a little bit about their self-regulation. They have some tools in their toolbox that they're able to access. 
but they still might not be really reading their internal cues, um, how we'd like or really adaptively so that they can communicate to others how they're feeling or so that they can understand and manage more of those complex emotions or feelings. Um, so this program is designed for autistic adolescents and teens to help them identify their emotions and their sensations in a way that's a little bit more authentic to their learning and thinking style. Um, here I have on this slide a little bit more of a neurotypical way of experiencing sensations and interpreting what they mean. So for example, we typically might think of a pounding head, a thumping head as indicating to us, I have a headache. And we might go off and we might take ibuprofen or we might do those things we do to reduce our symptoms like dimming lights or um, getting some fresh air. Heavy eyes to us might indicate I'm tired and really need to go get some sleep. Um, butterflies in the stomach is a common uh, metaphor we use for nervousness. Um, and that might be something that we might relate to, but that might not be meaningful to every kid or every teen. Um, and then tight fist, that typically often indicates anger, but that might not be the experience for everybody. So this next slide is um, an example of um, a couple of mine and Monique's clients who have described their experiences to us in ways that make sense to them and that we thought were kind of really beautiful ways of um, showing a different way of interpreting internal sensations. So a noisy head, meaning a headache, or itchy eyes, meaning, meaning tiredness. Um, my stomach is burning, and that's indicating to that child hunger. Or their slippery feet. I think that might have been sweaty feet, which indicated to that child that they were feeling nervous. Now, taking that um, sensation and mapping it onto a feeling, some kids might be able to do that really readily. And for some kids, that might be really challenging. I was recently listening to a podcast where um, an autistic uh, man, he was explaining that at work, he could go, you know, his whole work day, get home, get to bed, drink water the entire day. And while we might experience that, you know, sometimes where I'm like, oh, no, I haven't drank water at all today. The actual experience of going an entire day without having thirst or having that recognition um, could be really really um, detrimental depending on the emotion. If we're not able to adequately recognize those emotions that we're experiencing, map it onto something in our body, and then go out and do something to help those internal needs. So I think this program, um, and we'll have all of our resources um, and these programs linked at the end of this talk, but I think this program can be really powerful for um, those of you who have, maybe have older uh, children here tonight that they can start to look at this program and start to understand their interoception a little bit better. So now that we have discussed that we bridged from co-regulation and now we're in the stage of self-regulation, now we're at a point where the child is going to have some control in recognizing that one, I'm not in a regulated state and I need to implement some kind of strategy to get back to that band that Aubrey was talking about, that zone of regulation. Um, so before in the slides with those visuals of the different senses, the focus there was that uh, the trusted adult is really being the detective and their job is to kind of identify one, it might be the background noise, which we got a little bit going on right now. But uh, what I mean is that there's going to be more than just one factor that contributes to a child's dysregulated state. And now they're at a point where they're identifying some of that. And so some of the strategies may be that they know they need to do deep breathing because first and foremost, that's the automatic part of our body is breathing. And that is what Aubrey was saying before. And it's not to be overlooked because once we can recognize that and we can deep breathe, that can allow us to um, move towards a more regulated state. Then there are things just that a child might do at school. They might bring a fidget, keep it in their pocket, um, and they might choose to have a, some kind of stress ball that's in their desk that they can access. Um, at home, they might find a spot after school because they need just a place that the noise is limited. They've just been in a really, really overstimulating 
environment for the whole day. There's been demands on them all day. They just are coming back from, you know, maybe it was a partial virtual school life. And now they're coming into something that's really exhausting. Um, and so there are different things that they're going to start to recognize. And because we've moved up that hierarchy, they're going to have that control in identifying and kind of recognizing some of the changes. Because a big part of our central nervous system, which houses all this regulation, is that it changes and it's not going to be the same. So something that works for me today to regulate myself may not work on a different day. And the same is going to be true for your child. But if they have those underlying skills to recognize what some of those things feel like to them, that interoception, then it's going to be that much easier for them to find a tool that's going to be accessible and appropriate for them and get them back to that state where they can join in and participate and engage in the things and the demands across their environments. Um, so these are, it's not an exhaustive list, of course, but it's just are things that um, when they get to that point of self-regulation that they might be accessing on their own. And, and that's a really, um, a really big step in a child's shift from that need and support of a trusted adult to I'm selecting these things because I know that's that about my own self. Um, now these relate to the other systems of just things that a child might be selecting or even when it comes to we're at the beginning of the school year we're choosing clubs to be a part of or maybe there are teams that they can join and there are things like swimming and track and cross country and those are embedding so many regulatory functions and if we know and the child knows that I feel so much better I feel happier and able to you know complete my homework or you know talk to a friend on the bus when I do this right before then those are really awesome things that a child can recognize and a parent can reinforce and say, I noticed you're, you know, you seem this way after you do this activity. And these are activities that we can just then reinforce and allow them to select as they get older. Um, and, and just again, um, some other examples, something as simple as chewing gum, that's something that I personally do every day. And it's just one of those things that does keep me at a state of steadiness and you know, that repetitive, steady, predictable movement, it is regulating for me. So certain small changes into your day can really make a big impact on regulation overall. Um, and now that we're talking about our self-regulation, it's really important to now switch our gears to how do we go into, how does this regulation relate to our communication. And I did not make up this visual, but I am a visual learner. And I thought that this is beautifully uh, represented by um, a book called The Whole Brain Child. And it really, uh, it really just completely exemplifies what I mean by regulation comes first. So if we think about our brain as a house and the skills as the stairs in a house. Um, the downstairs brain is our regulation. So that's why Aubrey went first in our presentation because regulation comes first. We have to have that. We can't skip that step. And then once we get regulated, then we can have this meaningful engagement. And that's why in our early stages of, you know, you might be participating or in this, um, in this, workshop today and you might have an older child, but you might remember those days when your child was in early intervention and the focus is this relationship and engagement. And that's because we have to follow these steps because that downstairs brain, um, the downstairs part of our house is our foundation. And so when we are able to regulate or support our child in regulating, then we can engage. And to engage is to have a relationship. And then we can access these higher skills upstairs. So we want to go upstairs because I want to go upstairs with my kids. That's what I do every single day. That's my why is communication. And that is what has connected Aubrey and I since the beginning of our careers is that our roles are just so intertwined with one another. And 
we have been able to find that connection with our autistic children that we work with because they can't, they don't come without the other. So I need to be regulated to communicate, but I also need to communicate my regulation needs. That is a, a really, really important thing that can't be overlooked when we're considering what a child is dealing with when they're not regulated is that need to be able to communicate it because a lot of times our children or older uh, teenagers, they need the adult to do for them. But in order for them to do something, they need to communicate that. Um, so I really love this. Um, like I said, it's an analogy that's not made by me, but I think it really represents it beautifully. And it kind of goes into those that staircase. So it's a hierarchy. We want that regulation. And if we skip that, Yes, maybe we can have some of those higher skills, but it's a lot harder for me to organize my thoughts if I had to conduct a meeting while I am in back-to-back -back traffic and I'm running late. So if we think about it from, you know, our day-to-day, -day, it's hard to think clearly, you know, if we have, if there's a baby that's nonstop crying in the background and we're expected to, you know, list out the ingredients that we need for a recipe for someone to go to the store and get that those ingredients a lot harder when we have that interference and when we're regulated we might have no problem with that and that's really important for us to consider when it comes to our kids too is that it's not that they might not have those skills but if we don't have that bottom step it's going to be a lot harder for them to access that and it's really critical that the trusted adults and the therapists and the people around them can help them when that step might, might have fallen out. Um, so when we look at the roadmap, we talk about um, how co-regulation, we move into our, our self-regulation. So that looks like our trusted adults helping us. And then we're maybe giving our child choices because we know these systems are affected and we want to support them. And so we're saying, we know you need something here. So here are some choices, let's pick something. We're giving them some control over that. And then with the ultimate goal that they're selecting it and that they're expressing what's going on inside of them because they, they, at the end of the day, are the ones that can express and tell us what, what is going on internally. We unfortunately, we can do all the detective work to really try, but they are ultimately the ones that can really um, communicate and they're feeling that, not us, as much as we try to as, our, as supportive adults in their life. Now, um, in, the, in regards to our communication, it's so important that we honor total communication strategies when it comes to regulation. So we are not, for example, going to say, Tell, tell me that you need a break. You know, in a point, we have to remember that staircase. We are going to acknowledge some of the, the clues that we're seeing, and we're going to accept the communication that can occur based on the level of regulation that they have in those moments. And so that might be their body language. That is their facial expressions, their gestures. Um, it might be spoken language, but it might be pictures or a choice board or typing or texting or using an AAC device. Um, so all of those are accepted. There's not, you know, once you get to self-regulation, this is the thing that you need to use to access it. It's really important because we don't, we, we have to continue to honor all of those clues that we used earlier on when we were the adults um, supporting that regulation hand in hand with the child. Um, now, this is just an example, not tailored to um, any particular child, and it's just a resource from um, Practical AAC, and it just kind of exemplifies the need for a different mode to communicate. So in, we may have great spoken, great fluent spoken language, but when we hit that fight or flight and we are dysregulated, it is gonna be a lot harder for our autistic children to access that and communicate that. And to allow, once we're learning and understanding those, uh, those feelings and sensations, when we have those underlying skills, then we're giving those communication opportunities visually 
And it might look like something like this, where they're maybe they're not ready or able in that moment to use spoken language, but they're going to point to something and then that's going to direct you to what they need in that moment. Or maybe they'll explain it more later, but this allows you to kind of bridge that in moments where you're feeling like I'm not totally getting the full picture of what's going on. And this is especially true for our kids going back to school. You know, there might be something that happened and they might come home not totally themselves. And we want to make sure that there's always an option to communicate and it doesn't need to necessarily just be spoken language because we know that nonverbal behavior is also such a powerful form of communication. Um, so like I said, this is just an example, but I just want to promote that AAC or all other alternative forms to communicate what we need in those regulatory moments is um, really important. Um, now, we don't have a lot of time left and I don't wanna keep you guys, but we did include some case studies because we had some clear pinpointed information about these different sensory systems. But we also realize that sometimes examples are more um, the way that someone can connect to a situation and they might say, oh, that's my baby. My baby does this. And so, you know, in our first case study, it's about an eight-year-old child that's impulsive, hard to focus when there's background noise, might bite the ends of their pencil. Um, you know, they have a difficult time staying in their seat. You're getting reports from the teacher that they're constantly needing reminders for these things. Um, and so we included some homework strategies and some household activities that can be embedded into just your daily routine to then support how um, your child can regulate and also just natural things that can be a part of your family routine. Um, and one little plug is just, you know, just like if anyone has an Apple watch, it tells you like, close that, close your circle, your movement circle. And although it can be an annoying reminder, it's also an important reminder. And I uh, plug this because just 20 to 30 minutes of structured movement can really help release anxiety, um, support releasing endorphins, um, and get a child ready to be regulated, to have a restful night of sleep. Um, so even if it's just a couple activities that you have in your pocket that you're going to always have as you're after school or before bed. Um, that's something that, like Aubrey said, that proprioception, the always regulatory, that's where you're gonna be able to achieve um, that during your day, on a daily basis. Um, and then our other case is for a younger child, and this is um, kind of our under-responsive child, the child that might be harder to engage in a structured activity, they might be slower to warm, um, they might come off as accident prone, you know, they're not really, they're not really sure where their body is in space. Um, and so there's some other examples to describe that. And then um, in this example of some of those sensory activities, it's really related to play and what kind of things you can do in your home during your routines that you might say, aha, I already do this, but now I'm going to do it with a lot of intention because I know that this is providing my child who shows some of these signs in that last slide, um, it's gonna give them that input that's gonna help them get to a regulated state so they can learn and play. And play is learning for those littles and that's so important. So there's some examples for that as well. Um, and then just our resources. And uh, of course we are right at our nine o'clock time. So we acknowledge that some people might need to um, get off, but we are more than happy to stay if there are questions or if people wanted to direct their questions to email for immediate follow-up with um, either of us, but we so appreciate the time that you guys took out of your evening on a school night to come join us, and um, we hope that some of this information will be useful and applicable um, maybe not today, but maybe on a different day when you're looking for a strategy to help your child regulate.